Um, so may I welcome you to the second seminar that the Deccan Heritage Foundation has organized in collaboration with uh, the foundation of His Highness Sri Sri Kantadatta Narasimharaja Vadiyar of Mysore and the Center of Islamic Studies at Cambridge. I would like to thank the president of the Wadiyar Foundation, Her Highness Dr. Pramoda Devi Wadiyar for her support and judicious collaboration, and uh, Dr. Helen Filon from the uh, Deccan Heritage Foundation, with whom it was a pleasure to work when, in setting up the From Malabar to Coromandel series. Of great help was Neil Cunningham of Cambridge, whose knowledge and heartening help made today's and future presentations possible. I would also like to thank um, our Indian team, Shrikara Dattareya, the administrator, as administrator of the DHF in India, and, um, and Nandani Priya Tatikonde, who, um, who helped devise the logo and the poster, um, and also Nidhi Shah. So um, uh, because we are not, uh, because we started a little bit late, I won't go into the, um, the details of our seminar, but um, we are really delighted um, by, the, by the turnout and, and by the uh, range of geography that um, this, um, this has allowed, this format has allowed. Um, and so now I will turn it over to, to um, Her Highness to, um, to, to in, introduce uh, George Michel. Hello, good evening, George. I'm greatly pleased to see on Indian architecture of all periods, and in particular, those of the Deccan. George is also a founder trustee of the Deccan Heritage Foundation. One of the most distinguished architectural historians alive today, his important work has inspired younger scholars to focus their work on the Deccan. His legacy is alive in numerous younger academics, some of whom participate in our webinars. George was born in Australia and received a Bachelor of Architecture degree from the University of Melbourne in 1968. He received his PhD from the School of Oriental and African Studies, University of London in 1974, and soon after published his thesis on the architecture of ancient Chalukya temples around Badami in Karnataka. Thereafter, he has made the study of Deccan architecture and archeology span his life's work. It was almost 50 years ago, on the 16th of December, 1970, the George began measuring the monuments of Badami in Karnataka. This was at a time when few Indians, let alone foreigners, had heard of the Deccan, nor were they familiar with the Chalukyas, Yadavas, Kakatiyas, and Hoysalas, who were responsible for some of the most magnificent buildings and sculptures of India. While George has focused on their architectural achievements, he has also put on the map the architecture of the Deccan Sultanates. He has been a pioneer in all these architectural domains. He has also spent over 30 years researching and documenting the enormous ruined city of Hampi of Vijayanagar, among many other historical sites in the region. He lives in London with his partner, John Fritz, and divides his time between traveling to the Deccan, writing about architecture and playing his cello and piano, as he is an accomplished musician. <laughs> his publication includes over 50 books, and here is a small sampling of his books. Shrikara, can you please share the... <laughs> He's also responsible for... Oh, I see. <laughs> okay. All right. My goodness. Look at this. Okay. Yeah, these are the books, a small sampling of the books uh, of George Mitchell. He's also responsible and manages all the publications of the DHF, which are listed on their site. I would now like to invite Dr. George Mitchell to deliver the lecture in childhood years. Uh, thank you. Now I have to get my PowerPoint back. So how do I do that? So if you oh, right, here are, yes, yes, right, now. Yeah. Okay, welcome everybody from wherever you uh, are. Dr. Michelle, we, we still don't see your uh, presentation. So could you please uh, click on share screen, which is at the bottom. Thank you. 
Now I'm back to the PowerPoint. John. Need to go. Yeah. yeah. It, it was it was fine before, no? Zoom, hang on. Share screen. Okay. Then, and then please select the PowerPoint. Yes. And place share, yes? And then click on share, yeah. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, so are we back on the... Uh... Yeah, and please uh, go, click on slideshow. Yeah. Yes, and, and I've got, yeah. Are we now on the, on the, on the map? Where are you going to see the yes. map? Yeah, here we go. Okay, right. Now, if I want to use a pointer, can you see my little cursor? Yes, yes. if you want to use a pointer, just use your little cursor and um, if you just click on it again. Okay, very good. Yeah, just... Okay, so apologies everybody. The tech, it, it, this has been a technical challenge. Measuring a, a Chalukya temple is one sort of thing I can do because I'm equipped and, and trained for it, though I don't have the energy, but actually manipulating this is, is, is another challenge. So ladies and gentlemen, 50 years ago, I arrived in this area of India on a Tonga at Badami railway station and went to stay at this unspeakable guest house and from which I made excursions every day on a local bus to measure these temples. And before I went, I had to um, argue or had to persuade my um, committee, as we would say, in London about doing this, selecting the Chalukya temples as a subject for a PhD. And they said to me, we don't know anything about these monuments. Why would you want to go there? What are these things? So I had to um, tell them that these were the earliest, best preserved Hindu monuments that we have anywhere in India. They're not the only early ones, but they're the largest concentration of temples that we have standing in good condition. And furthermore, they are concentrated, or at least this group is, in quite a small area, and they are built in different styles, which means if we go to one area, we can see in the 7th and 8th centuries about what was happening in Indian architectural design. There's nowhere else in India we could do this. And this was a reason to go there. So here is a map of the zone in which I did my research and which is the heartland of the Chalukyas, who were the principal rulers of the Deccan region of peninsular India in the 6th, 7th and first half of the 8th centuries. Here is Badami, and here is the famous railway station, the RS, where I took the Tonga. And every day we took buses to Patadakal and buses around to Aiholi. And these were sites which had early Chalukya monuments. They are linked by this river, the Malprabha River, which, which creates this sort of valley. And this valley, which still today is very well irrigated, it's lush, is in complete contrast to the surrounding landscape, which is rather arid. So this was a sort of place where the population and elite of this ruling group were concentrated. And it's as these places, um, Badami was the capital. Mahakuta is a, a sacred center with a spring. Patadakal is a ceremonial center where the kings and their queens built important monuments. And Aiholi was a commercial town from which there was a very important guild called the Ayavoli 500, which fanned out all over South India and lasted well after the Chalukyas doing their various um, commercial tie-ups and, and deals. So this is the sort of zone in which we operate. And this is Badami. And you can see it's in this um, amazing red sandstone landscape. It is one of the most beautiful towns, villages in the Deccan, and it's a good reason to visit the site. We are on a cliff called the South Fort. We are looking across to the North Fort, and this is a tank an artificial reservoir uh, with, with a bund, with a, with a wall, keeping the water in. And here is the town 
in which the Chalukyas were based. You can see a temple here and a temple here on top of the cliff. And in the fort, in the south, southern cliff in which we are standing, we have these rock-cut monuments. These are the so-called caves, the Badami caves. And they're very important because they are dated to the end of the sixth century and they are of, of, of very well preserved. This is one of the, a typical cave. You can see that the cliff is left more or less natural and the artificial part is just cut straight into the cliff. There's no transition. So we, we don't have a sort of merging of man-made and uh, natural. We just have an abrupt transition into this architecture which probably imitates wood. And as we go into cave one, on the right we see this magnificent dancing Shiva. It's one of the first great icons we have of this Hindu god in Indian art and um, still in great state of preservation. You can see the god is provided with, I think, double eight arms of all the different positions. Somebody is playing here, an attendant is playing a drum. Of course, Ganesh and Nandi have to be in attendance. This is a typical plan of one of the Badami caves. You enter through a colonnade into a sort of outer veranda and from there progress into a hall which is surrounded by columns and beyond is the rock cut chamber, the sanctuary. In this case um, it depends whether it's a cave dedicated to Vishnu or to Shiva. We have no original icons left here though we do have a linga in the Shiva cave. We're now in the Vishnu cave, cave number three. It's the largest and most elaborate of the caves at Badami. It's also the only one with a precise date. It's dated Shaka 500. Shaka is the era used in South Indian um, chronologies. It translates into our years as 578. It's the, um, the best dated um, cave temple of the Hindus that we have. And this is looking along the outer aisle. Notice these columns, which have these faceted shafts taking the light and reflecting the light in opposition to these shafts, which have carved reliefs, and these brackets, which I'll show you in a minute. At the end, we have this magnificent uh, seated Vishnu. He's on, on Ananta, the, the, the great cosmic serpent. Coils are here, the hoods come up, over the head of the god to protect him. He's wearing the typical crown, and of course he holds the disc and the conch, which is by, we recognize him. And at the other end of the aisle, we see Vishnu as Narasimha, as the man lion. Um, he's a, he has a, a ferocious lion head, as you can see, and he was originally leaning on a club, but this got smashed over the years. And there's also a depiction of Trivikrama, Vishnu, as the, as the um, pacer of the three cosmic steps. And he, there he is kicking one of the steps. And um, this is a legend. It's part of one of the avatars of Vishnu. And these are larger than human size. They're really very impressive carvings um, sculpted out of the cliff face. And as you enter the cave, there are these brackets. Now these brackets do not actually support anything, they're part of the mountain, but of course in structural architecture these type of brackets would support the, the beams. They would transmit the load of the beam to the, um, to the um, column beneath. And each of these brackets is carved with a couple. And they're being very friendly, these couples. You can see they're happy couples, as they say in India. And they're beneath flowering trees, trees with flowers in them. And these are very important auspicious motifs that provide protection for the cave as you go in. And they are, of course, um, a ubiquitous feature in Indian art and architecture. If you've been to Sanchi, you will see maidens. If you go to the Hoysala temples, you will also see these brackets with maidens. So something which is known throughout Indian art and architecture. And we have a tantalizing fragment of a, of a mural. And these seem to be courtly women in attendance on a seated figure, possibly a depiction of one of the Chalukya kings that's not preserved. But it shows you that after Ajanta, 
at the end of the fifth century, um, sixth century, we also have here in 570 at the end of the sixth century, we also have paintings. It's just that very little of it is left. This gives you an idea of the type of columns in the um, in cave one. This one is the Shiva cave. You can see a little bit of a Nandi here. Look at these compressed, fluted capitals, something very typical of the style. And look at the designs. Every face of every column in these caves have these different types of designs with uh, jewel motifs, um, bands of pearls, gems. And then we have these fantastic, or let's say fantasy compositions. Here we have a human torso clutching a fish, both dissolving into foliation. And we have ceilings. These magnificent ceiling panels is a feature of Chalukya art and architecture. Here we have a coiled naga, a serpent. This creature was originally holding a, um, a sort of garland protected by his hoods. And look at the coiled serpent all the way around. And this wonderful relief ornament. So that's what you see above. Also, we have these flying figures, a celestial couple with their legs kicked back. This means flying through the air. And you can see their billowing draperies. So they are flying in to celebrate the god who is worshipped here. Now from Badami we move to Aiholi. And this is a cave, another cave temple of the end of the sixth century. It's called Ravana Padi, the rock of Ravana. And it has this freestanding fluted column in front, which may have had an inscription on it. We know of other fluted columns which do. This one is too worn, sadly. So we don't know who made this cave or when, which is a shame because it is a showpiece of Chalukya art. We're inside the cave temple now at Aiholi. You can see it's a Shaivite one with a linga here. And we have these figures on the side, guardian figures. And in a side chamber, we have this magnificent dancing Shiva attended by the seven matrikas, the seven mothers. And you have to excuse this distortion in the photography. You see here the curve. This is because there's so little space to set up the camera to set up the lens that only by using a telephoto lens like this can we get all of this in. So another magnificent dancing Shiva, late sixth century. Opposite is Durga and her, you can see she, with her trident, she's thrusting this into the rump of the buffalo demon that she's killing. So a, a standard theme also in Chalukya art. Now from the cave temples, the rock cut architecture, we now go to this monument, which as you can see is freestanding and it's structural. That is, it's built of uh, dressed sandstone slabs assembled without any mortar, though probably with a bit of iron clamps to hold the whole thing together. And this is on a hill called Meguti that looks down on the town of Aiholi. So it's sometimes called the Meguti Temple. It's a Jain monument. And we know about this because there's an inscription, which I'll show you in a minute here, which tells us all about it. This is written in Sanskrit, though it's in a, in a, in a, a Southern Indian script. It's dated 634, which means that this is the earliest dated structural temple that we have in India. And it tells us all about the king, Pulikeshan, what he did, boasting about his victories. It also is important because it mentions the great um, poet and dramatist Kalidas, Kalidasa, who wrote Shakuntala and other famous plays. This is the first mention of Kalidas in a dated inscription. He lived earlier and he wasn't in the Chalukya territory, but his fame had spread to the Deccan where he is mentioned by the court poet of Purikeshan I. Now this is a temple, a structural monument above Badami. As you can see, it's missing part of its walls. It's possible that this temple was partly dismantled when the Chalukya territory, the kingdom, was invaded by the Pallavas to the south. Now the Chalukyas in the Deccan and the Pallavas in the Tamil country were by no means friendly. They had raids against each other. And in the middle of the seventh century, the Pallavas occupied Badami. And I think 
most likely dismantled the royal temples above the town because these symbolized the power of the Chalukyas. No matter, what we see is very important. It's a first half of the seventh century structural temple with its tower. And this was missing in the Meguti temple. But if we go round the corner, let's just, what, what is next? Yes, if we go round the corner from the, the um, upper Shivalia, it's called, we come to the Maligiti Shivalia. This is another uh, structural temple at Badami, and it is fully preserved, quite possibly because it was built after the Pallava invasion. We, temper, we, we assign a date to this temple in the second half of the seventh century. Anyhow, and now you get a lesson in the standard South Indian style of temple architecture. What you see here, which is one of the drawings that my, I and my team did all those years back, gives you an idea of how the temple is put together from a design point of view. Going across this way, we have a porch, and then we have a mandapa, we have a hall with windows, so when, uh, light can go into it, and then this is the outer wall of a sanctuary. It's a linga sanctuary because it's a Shiva temple and this way if we go vertically we have a basement we have moldings which are beneath the floor line inside we call it a basement we then have the walls and the walls project they recess they project they recess so they go backwards and forwards and every time they move they have a pilaster so these pilastered walls are typical of the Dravida or South Indian style and then we have a parapet and these parapets are made up of roof elements. This is a little sort of dome square element. This is a barrel vaulted element. This is another dome square and a barrel vault. And this parapet of elements is another feature of the South Indian style. Now, some of these go are repeated up here. We have the pilastered wall and we have the parapet at a second upper level of the story. And the whole thing is crowned with an octagon to dome. So I hope you don't find this boring, but it does um, analyze the essential elements. And then you will see how these elements progress stylistically. So as Chalukya architecture evolves, so do, so do the styles. On, the, on this um, temple here in the middle of the, of the Mandapa wall there, we have this magnificent standing um, Shiva. We, tell, we can tell he's Shiva from the trident that he holds here. And on exactly the same position on the other wall, this is the south wall, on the north wall, we have an equally impressive image of Vishnu, which I don't have to show you. Now we're fast forwarding from the second half of the seventh century to the second half of the eighth century. So we're in about the 740s now. And we are at Patadakal, which is this site on the Malprabha River, where the kings and the queens of the Chalukyas built monuments of a great uh, impressive scale. We are looking at what is now called the Virupaksha Temple and its neighbor, the Malukarjuna Temple. And these were built by two sister queens for their lord, um, who, who had come back Vikramaditya from a successful campaign against the Pallavas and in order to celebrate their lord, their husband's victory, they patronized these two temples that were originally named after them. They weren't called Virupaksha then but Loka Mahadevi was, was the name of, the, of one of the queens and the temple was called after her. And we know all this because on this column we have an inscription which tells us all this information, which is something we treasure because these are things to anchor our understanding of architecture. Now, this is the drawing of the Virupaksha temple of Patadakal. Now, you don't have to be an architectural historian to see we've come a long way from this. This is towards the end of the seventh century. This is towards the middle of the eighth century. Can you see how elaborate this architecture has become. We still have the basements, we still have the pilastered walls with the niches and the windows, and we have the tower now in one, two, and three stories, each with pilastered walls and parapets with a square to dome top. So this is an extremely elaborate monument. It, it is what we could say is for state of the art 
of the South Indian temple design just prior to the middle of the 8th century. Well, we know that this temple was built after the military campaign, which was in the 743, I think, or 742, and before the destruction of the Chalukya kingdom in the 750s by the Rashtrakutas, who invaded this part of the Deccan. They displaced the Chalukyas and they took over as the supreme rulers of the Deccan. They were responsible for the rock cut Kailas at Ellora. Now, some of you may have been to Ellora and saw that amazing monolithic temple. And this is a copy of this. It's a rock cut facsimile of a temple, of this temple, but in the rock cut. And if I had a photograph of it, you would understand, but I don't at the moment. So some of the carvings on the Virupaksha temple at Patadakal give you an idea of the splendor of the craftsman. Here we have Shiva appearing out of the linga, which is mythological. And then we have these magnificently ornate pediments. Look at these two peacocks with their fanciful tails. Or Vishnu kicking the three paces, Trivikrama. This time we have these makaras, these aquatic monsters with these elaborate tails. Um, what I would like to say is that the relief decoration, this part, is almost as visually enriching as the high relief carvings of the icons. And um, this part of the temple has been much less studied than this. Art historians, my fellow colleagues, tend always to these type of images because they can do iconographic analysis. But people interested in temple design and decorative arts should look at these. We have these magnificent images of Shiva all over the Patadakal temples. Many, many aspects. This is um, him in his sort of, he's wearing, has tusks and matted hair. So this is Shiva in his more ferocious form. And we also have these carved windows. These are really spectacular displays of I would st stone cutting because they almost defy the sandstone out of which they have been fashioned. This is, looks like it's a free-flowing um, graphic drawing, but actually it's carved out of stone. Every window in the Virupaksha temple is different. Look at this one with, with peacocks. It's really extraordinary. And then we have our friends who welcome us as we enter the temple, uh, the, the, the happy couples, as my local guide and Badami calls them, and they are happy. They're also beautifully dressed and costumed. And I would like to suggest if anybody was interested in what the courtly um, elite of the Chalukyas was wearing in the 730s or 740s, they could do no better than study the necklaces, the crowns, the costumes, the hairdos. Look at these, the, 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 the waist, uh, waistbands here and the tassels that they are wearing. We also have these characters leaning on clubs. They are larger than any other images carved on the temple. And they are the guardians, the Devarapalas. They ensure that nobody, no um, negative force can proceed into the temple. And they are carved almost in the round. They are attached to this column you see at the back. They are monolithic with this column. So they are magnificent, um, I would say, uh, figures. They welcome the good people, they dissuade the bad ones. And we have Surya riding in his um, aerial chariot through the clouds. Here are the clouds. Here is the chariot. The, um, and here are the horses of the chariot. And here's Surya, the sun god, on the east porch. And this is when we enter the temple. We're proceeding towards the linga, which is here. Now, now again in worship, and the columns, these massive columns that support the ceiling, they have these reliefs on them. And these reliefs are narrative, they tell stories. This particular frieze tells the story of the Ramayana. Here we have the fighting monkeys, Vali and Sugriva. Here we have Hanuman on his coiled tail, seated in front of uh, Ravana. These are all um, episodes from the Ramayana, the Mahabharata, the Krishna story, they are all depicted here. Here we have the churning of the cosmic ocean. You see? It? And here we have Durga riding on her lion, 
towards the buffalo-headed demon who, who retreats. So these are old stories that local guides will explain to you if you go there today. And it's quite possible that in the eighth century, local guides also did this for the visitors at the time. And in a side shrine at the Virupaksha temple, if you get the priest to get the key and open it up, you get this sculpted image of Durga plunging her tripod, her trident, into the neck of the buffalo demon, who's here in a human form emerging out of what I think here is the animal form. Look how it's sculpted completely in 3D. Of course, it's stained by all the oil that, that worshippers have smeared on it, but it's one of the most extraordinary pieces of sculpture that we have, I think, from the 8th century anywhere in India. Opposite is this pavilion for Nandi, because Nandi is the bull on whom Shiva rides and is the protector and representative of the god, and he is still in worship. Now, don't be put off by this sort of plastered, oiled um, sort of exterior. This has been applied in modern times to its original stone um, uh, form, and you can see people are still today um, offering rice, sounding the bell, and garlanding Nandi. It's a magnificent image. Somebody stands no higher than this, so it's huge. Now, from the South Indian Dravida architecture, we're going to take a leap into another style of architecture, what we call Nagara, or Northern Indian. And this coexisted in the Chalukya territories under circumstances which we do not understand very well, but it seems somehow that architects and designers skilled and experienced in the Nagara style came into the Chalukya territory and were commissioned to build temples in this style. We're now at Mahakut. Mahakut is a sacred site with, as you can see at the bottom, um, a spring feeding a tank um, with fresh water, much patronized by the local boys, as you can see down here, and the temples are in worship today. So this is a site which has been in continuous worship since, I think, the sixth century. It's still one of the great sacred sites in the Badami region. And this temple is built in the Nagara style, and you can see immediately it has a different sort of tower. It has a curved profile, it's divided into horizontal layers, and it's topped with a ribbed motif that we call an amalaka. It's a sort of gourd, or like a sort of pumpkin, if you like. Um, it's a stone ribbed um, motif that all crowns a Nagara type of temple. And it also appears in the tower itself. I will show you again. So this is called the Sangameshra temple at, uh, at Mahakut, and this is one of the images on it, an extremely gracious Adhanarishvara, that is Shiva as the androgyne, half Parvati, half Shiva, and the sculptor has very skillfully portrayed the female half, one breast, and the female hip, and here the male contour. So one of these marvelous bringing together of male and female um, physics, physic figures, and on the on the same temple is uh, Vishnu as the boar, Varaha, the incarnation, nuzzling the goddess Bhu, whom he has rescued from the coils of this watery demon. And in case you didn't know who it was, we have this conveniently um, labeled here in Roman script and in Kannada script. Now we're going to a, another temple. This is at Aiholi, built in the Nagara style. It's quite simple. It has a sort of porch, you can see here. It has a hall, it's plain walls, and behind the hall is a sanctuary with a northern type tower. And on the front face of this tower is this motif. Now, if any of you have visited the rock-cut monuments of the Buddhists in the Deccan, you'll be familiar with the Chaitya halls, the great Buddhist halls, which have these arches. And this type of arch is known as a Chaitya arch. Not that it's Buddhist, it's just, a, I would say, a Deccan feature. It's a three-quarter circle, you can see here, and in the middle of it is a dancing Shiva, with the Nandi and Parvati here. And it has a sort of top here, and it has a sort of side 
just so get used to this feature. This is a, a Chaitya arch, which in South India we call a Kudu. Now from this temple, which is not very exciting, we have these magnificent ceiling panels. These are among the very few items of Chalukya art that have been removed from the monuments. This is in the Bombay Museum. It shows Brahma, of whom three out of the four heads are visible, and he is flanked by cloud-bearing rishis, or sort of holy characters, who are paying him homage and also with Vishnu sleeping on the cosmic serpent. Here, he's laid aside his weapons, his head is on the coils the, uh, of the Naga, and there's also one of Shiva. So here are the three main gods, if you like, the three, the, tr uh, the Trimurti of, of Hinduism are depicted in the ceiling panels of the uh, Huchapaya Gudi, it's called this temple, which just is a local name. And they are, of course, the glories of the collection in Bombay. And they are among the very few images taken from the Chalukya sites. There are three or four in Bombay, there's two in Aiholi, and there are absolutely none in Europe or the United States. So any of you who are familiar with the Indian collections in say the British Museum, the V&A, the Metropolitan Museum, the Musée Guimet or wherever, you will not see any Chalukya art. And I think it's one of the reasons why Chalukya, the phase of Chalukya sculpture is much less appreciated outside India than is possible in India because we have no representatives at all. Now we're coming to a more evolved Nagara, Northern Indian style temple at Patadakal. And this temple is built only a few meters away from the great pair of temples built by the sisters the, of the, the queens, the two sister queens, in the southern Indian style. So we have the impression that there were these two groups of craftsmen and designers working side by side at the same time, at the, at the same site, patronized by the kings who obviously enjoyed having temples built in different styles. This is the uh, Galaganath temple at Patadakal. It's missing a lot of its lower sections, but its upper parts are perfectly preserved, including its Amalaka finial. And I would date this temple, again, 720s, 730s, the first half of the eighth century. But look here at one of the details. This comes from somewhere down here. So if you blow up one of these bits, you get this. Here we have our kudu, or our chaitya arch, larger. Here we have our chaitya arch, smaller. We, here we have a chaitya arch broken up. It's like one of these that has been cut into and split. So I call it a split kudu. And here we have a split trefoil kudu. So you can see all these different motifs come from this. They're derived from this. And by manipulating them, we get these patterns on the tower. And it leads to this sort of pattern. This is a sort of mesh arranged entirely from bits of the Chaitya arch, which have been disembodied, split up, and recombined to create this fantastic geometry. And we have these horizontal versions, let me get my here, of these ribbed motifs. So this is the language, if you like, of the Nagara style. So my original project was to learn this by measuring all these temples, and there was nowhere else in India that I could do that without traveling. This is a close-up of the Kashi Vishwanath temple, as it's called again, and again you can see all these different motifs, this complexity of design that comes from the manip manipulation of single elements. We're now going to um, Aiholi, to a temple known as the Durga temple. It's the most famous temple at Aiholi, and it has nothing to do with Durga, who is the goddess. Because in Canada, the word Durg means fort. And at some point, this temple had a tower on it of bricks and stone and mud, and it was used as a lookout for the village. Anyhow, it's unusual because it has an apsidal end, and by which I mean this semicircular end. Now, this is built around a circular pedestal inside the sanctuary on which uh, an image or emblem of the deity was worshipped. 
the trouble is we don't have anything left. There's just a slot. And there's been some discussion about who was worshipped there. I think the latest theory is that probably Surya, the sun god. But this is by no means for sure. And around this, we have a, 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 an apsidal wall with an inner walkway you can see here you can walk around here to pay worship with a hall and the whole thing is contained in a in in a, in a temple with a porch there are windows allowing light to come into the to the hall and into the passageway and then the whole thing is set within an outer veranda here and these numbers locate the great sculptures which are displayed here so this is an outer view, again, with amorous couples on the outer columns. And these are the sculptures in the ambulatory passageway of the Durga temple. This is a Shiva leaning on Nandi. It's a magnificent piece. And it does not seem to have belonged to this temple originally, because these pilasters, these little columns on the side, are cut away, can you see here, on either side to accommodate it. It's as if it was it was brought here and they cut away bits of it and it was placed here. It's no doubt a Chalukya piece and it possibly comes from a temple at the site, but we don't know, um, sorry, from where it comes. And the same is true of this piece, which doesn't seem to belong either, but has been placed here. So this doesn't tell us who was worshipped in the temple. All it tells us is that magnificent carvings of different gods and goddesses were brought here and placed at the Durga temple. Anyhow, this is Vishnu, and you can see this funny creature here with wings. This is Garuda, his eagle mount. Another temple at Patadakal, um, which is more um, very intriguing too, is the Papana temple. It's a few meters away from the main group, and it has a northern Indian Nagara type um, tower. And this is the um, wall. Of the temple. Now it has a South Indian type um, basement and it has a South Indian type um, parapet, but it has North Indian type pediments. These are the designs that go above the sculpture niches. And these designs are each different, though uh, variants of these little motifs, these little kudu motifs that I've been talking about. So what this temple tells us that on special occasions, craftsmen and designers from both the South Indian, the Dravida school, and from the Nagara school, were put together to work on the same monument. Under what circumstances, we don't know. We have no historical data about this temple, but there must have come a moment when somebody, the king, the minister said, why don't we put these two styles together and make a monument that is a sort of, um, that does both for us? No problem. This is what we have. And the, the monument is extremely interesting for these panels. I think these are the next pictures. Right, here we have Rama shooting his bow. Look again at this design. Here we have another design on top and here we have the monkeys. And this of course, these are scenes from the Ramayana. So we have on these wall panels, uh, just before the middle of the 8th century, we have a complete, I think there are about 25, 26 of them, um, panels telling the story of Rama and culminating in the great battle with, um, at Lanka. But to get to Lanka, the monkeys and, the, and, and Rama had to cross the uh, sea and they had to build a bridge. And this is what you have here. Here are stones, are stones of a bridge set in the watery waves of an ocean. Here are the monkeys on the other side of the ocean about to fight Ravana, which forms the class of the story. This is the entrance to the temple, very elaborate. The archaeological survey um, must be congratulated on, on, on a rather boring doorway, but it's locked there, but we shall go in in a minute. Again, we have these um, elaborate makaras, these aquatic monuments with tails. We have river goddesses down here. We have lions up here. So there's a complete decor of protecting the entrance to the monument. And inside we have these fantastic lions, these um, um, brackets. We have these, um, these very ornate beams. Here we have 
I, if you can see this, an upside down version of the coiled Naga ceiling that we saw in the cave temple at the beginning of my talk. So there it was at the end of the sixth century. Here again, it is in probably towards the middle of the eighth century. We have the same theme in the temple. And the ceiling panel over the inner of the two mandapas of this temple is another one of these beautiful dancing shivas. This is my, my all time favorite. Um, beautifully lit, naturally, from little light coming in on the side. And he's with Parvati here and with the various musicians and, of course, Nandi. So these are some of the really epic, I would say, carvings that we have of the Chalukyas. Now, we're going to finish up with some temples which are not built in the northern style, and they're not built in the southern style, they're built in the local style. And since one way of characterizing the local type of architecture is the geography of this location, I've nicknamed this style the Malprabha style. Malprabha is the name of the river that runs through the Chalukya heartland. And one of the features of this type of architecture are the sloping roofs. You see here, these are sloping roofs and they seem to have logs on the roofs. Do you see these logs laid here? These are stone and they imitate wooden logs laid no doubt on thatched roofs, which must have been built at this time. I should mention that what we have been looking at are just the stone remnants of a complete tradition which must have encompassed timber and thatch, all of which are sadly lost. So we have um, a great um, building with three windows allowing light inside and the sanctuary, the temple where you paid worship is on top. And you could reach this from a ladder inside the porch. And in the old days we used to go up here, go up here and make the drawings that we have. Today they've blocked that off so you can't do that anymore. And it would say, seem that this building maybe was primarily in the service of the local council, it was like a civic monument or a town hall. Because Iholi, as I mentioned before, was of great importance economically. And uh, there are a great number of temples built by local people rather than kings or queens. And maybe this was for the municipal, uh, the municipality of Iholi. That we can only speculate on. This is what it looks like. Here is the sanctuary at the top, and here is the entrance with, again, we have our um, auspicious couples, our happy couples, though sadly worn here. Uh, here's a close up. Again, with the tree, always beneath the tree, these couples. So we had this in the cave temples uh, in the 578. Um, cave temple number three at Badami from the end of the sixth century. Here, probably in the early part of the eighth century, we have the same, the same topic. And I should say this goes on through Deccan temple architecture. And um, I'm now working on a book which carries this theme right through to the 13th century, right through from, to the late Chalukyas, the later kings of that name, the Hoysalas, and also the Kakatiyas, all of which all of whom built temples with brackets and columns with these wonderful couples. And to finish off this talk, I'll just show you one of the most magnificent of the Nandis that goes with these Chalukya temples. We are back at Mahakuta, and here we have a Nandi which has not been, uh, um, I would say, plastered over and oiled. It just shows you the extraordinary naturalism that Chalukya artists could achieve with the sandstone that they were polished here. Um, a beautiful, um, almost life-size replica of an animal. So um, I'm finishing now, and if I don't know what the format is, I'd be very happy to answer any questions if people would like to, to respond. So thank you so much, George, and I will clap for you on behalf of everybody. It was really a masterful uh, lecture, and um, and you know, it's it was really wonderful to walk around the site with you, and um, and just and and take in these beautiful um, these be beautiful buildings. Uh, we should just give everybody a few seconds to gather their thoughts. Um, 
And um, if you can just go into the chat box um, and, um, and start to raise questions, I, um, I, I, I will read them out for Dr. Michelle. Um, so um, we'll just give everybody a moment um, to take that in. Uh, Helen, if you have any questions, um, uh, we can, uh, you can also, um, uh, we, we, we would entertain them as well. I, ha I mean, I can, I, I can ask the first question to you, George, that I think um, may inspire other people. Um, I'm really interested in um, this sort of Nagara Dravida uh, situation that we have going on with the Chalukyas. Can you talk more about um, sort of who these craftsmen were and, and, and how they had access to these different kinds of styles? Well, we have some information about the architects and the craftsmen due to inscriptions. So we know the name of some of the carvers who did the sculptures, and we have the names of some of the architects or designers who were given very important titles. So they were important people. They had significance for the Chalukyas. Now, we've always wondered how come the, the Southern Indian style, which belongs to the Deccan and, and the southernmost part of India, that is the region from which it is generated, um, that is explainable. But what is the Northern Indian style doing in the Deccan? It seems to be the, the, the big question. Now, when the Pallavas invaded Badami in the middle of the 7th century, the Chalukya elite relocated to the eastern Deccan. They relocated to an area which is now Andhra and Telangana. And we have temples, a few temples of the Chalukyas and inscriptions and information about their stay in that eastern Deccan. And it would seem that this region was more receptive to central India and what we would call Madhya Pradesh, let's say. There was more um, communication with central India where these northern Indian styles were in full swing and the eastern Deccan than they were in what is now Karnataka. And when they came back from, when they got rid of the Pallavas and relocated to Badami, they started building in this north Indian style, not before. And just to finish off, this so-called Dravida style is first found in the Chalukya territories. So even though it flourished in Tamil Nadu, of course, eventually, and the Pallavas built in it, the Pallavas only started building South Indian style Dravida monuments after they came back from the Chalukya territories. So it is possible that Chalukyas invented this Dravida style. Um, now we have sort of a waterfall of questions. <laughs> right. Um, Sorry. So when it rains, it pours. Um, the first question, I, I'll read two uh, questions for you. Um, are there any images of Buddha as a Vishnu avatar here? And what sort of thatching materials might have been available in the Deccan? These are two very different questions, no? Buddha is yeah. found, <laughs> Buddha is found as Buddha, not as avatar. There are at least two images that I know of, of Buddha, one at Badami, one at Aiholi, both of which are defaced. It would seem there was a Buddhist community that patronized modestly and that there was a conscious effort at some point to dismantle their cult and discredit their cult. So this is quite interesting, I think. And um, I could expand on that. In the guidebook that I, that I authored on the Chalukis, is a little bit of that. The thatch material, well, it must have been local. You can still see huts built in mud and wattle and, you know, and bamboo and thatch. It's just the local, I guess, from, from the fields that they gather the thatch. Um, I'll read the next question. Uh, why did the Chalukis put all that effort into these intricate ceilings? <laughs> <laughs> you mean why the question is really why didn't other people do it why 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 do the chalukyas particularly like ceilings and not only the chalukyas all of the deccan temples have magnificent ceilings especially the the hoysalas just think of their ceilings or the late chalukya ceilings or the nolamba ceilings which are just marvelous i don't know it seems to be a regional specialty of course gujarat has ceilings too you know you've got marvelous ceilings but these figural designs 
especially in nine compartments, are very popular in the, in the Chalukya territories. I can't tell you why, I can only tell you how. Um, can you perhaps shed some light on the Aihole Guild of Workers and Merchants who built and financed these temples? I think you started to answer that question when I... When I well, we know about these Ayavole, you know, this famous guild that, that um, uh, you know, um, their business contacts stretched all over South India and I believe even into Southeast Asia. And they, they outlasted the Chalukyas right up until the 10th and 11th centuries. We have inscriptions of these Ayavole, but we don't have one temple which says this was built by the Ayavole guild. We have temples at Ayavole, most of them tell us nothing. We have no information who actually built them. We just have a tremendous amount of them. But Aiholi, unlike Badami and Patadakal, has temples which are after the early Chalukyas. So we have from the Rashtrakutas and from the late Chalukyas, that is, into the 10th, 11th, and the 12th centuries, we have a lot of monuments at Aiholi. So this was a place where um, business went on and temple patronage went on, but not at Badami and not at Patadakal. Um, another question, which I was also interested in, um, are there other paintings anywhere on the sites? That, and can you tell us about them? That painting that you showed was absolutely gorgeous, George. Um, it is gorgeous. And, and what is so intriguing is that there is in the Badami Archaeological Museum a drawing, a line drawing, which was made by um, a specialist many years back, before I came, so let's say um, 50, 40, 50 years ago, if not more, of what they could see of that painting then, which you can no longer see, which shows a complete scene of a seated um, courtly figure, maybe a king, surrounded by women and musicians. But this is, I think, almost no, maybe a slight touch of color on a bracket or something, but we don't have any painted compositions in any other of the Chalukya um, monuments that I could find. Um, I think we, we only really have time for one more question now, um, but I, and I'm going to give it to um, this, this uh, rather, I think, significant question. Um, bes besides the Queen Sisters, are there any other women patrons or donors um, uh, involved in the making of these temples? Um, not that I can think, I mean, named, you mean, that we know the names of. I believe, yeah, I mean, I, I think the... the have, um, I think they are the, um, they are the great exceptions, these two huge, m magnificent monuments matching architecturally and artistically by two sisters, I guess the older queen, older sister built the bigger one and the, the smaller one, who knows, we don't, we don't have that information. But um, no, I, not that I can recall instantly. Okay, so um, I want to thank you, uh, George, for this really lovely talk and um, I will clap for you, everybody will be clapping for you. Um, and I will turn it over to Dr. Helen Filon now um, to um, close the, the lecture. I'm unmuting you. I, you. We can't hear you, Helen, can we? Can you hear me now? Yes. 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 Okay. I just wanted to thank George for this really uh, fascinating lecture. Um, I've learned so much, um, though I've read your many of your articles and books, this was a new approach, which I thought was fascinating. And I love the fact that you have all these styles that coexist, which is something that you have also in the Deccan in the later periods, which is also interesting. And uh, it was really wonderful to see these images and to see the quality of the work that the South has produced. And we look, uh, and thank you very much. And thank you, I would also like to thank Her Highness for for introducing you and we look forward to seeing all of you again in the next webinar uh, when uh, we'll have the discussion on the book that uh, uh, Richard Eaton has written and we look forward to that. Thank you very much for thank your you. attention. Thank you very thank much. You every, thank you everybody for, for attending and um, maybe one day I'll be able to take some more of you around Badami. <laughs> yes, we'd love that. <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you. you.
Thank you.